Thank you so much, uh, Bill, for that uh, very charitable word of introduction. Uh, I should have brought my wife with me to hear all of that because <laughs> I've been trying to tell her for 45 years that I was really somebody. <laughs> and, uh, but seriously, it's good to be here. Uh, good to have a full house at 9 o'clock uh, in the morning. My role, as has been stated, is to uh, discuss the civil rights movement uh, in Birmingham. The civil rights movement, without question, was one of the great movements for social and racial justice in the history of the United States. Beginning in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955 with a bus boycott led by Martin Luther King Jr., blacks and their white allies challenged the legal system of segregation in the American South and were able to prevail. The civil rights campaign in Birmingham was one of the major events in this civil rights struggle. It brought the issue of racial justice to the forefront of national consciousness and is generally conceded to have led to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, one of the two peaks of the Civil Rights Movement. What was the nature of the Birmingham Movement? The tendency has been to focus on the year 1963 when Martin Luther King Jr. and his organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, came to the city. And there was outstanding publicity and wide television coverage. And without question, King's efforts in 1963 would lead to the climax of the Birmingham movement and would lead to its ultimate success. However, to garner the full story and to get a more complete understanding of the civil rights movement in Birmingham, it is necessary to go back to the year 1956 when the movement really began. In 1956, Birmingham was one of the most uh, segregated cities in the United States. One of the most racially polarized cities in the nation. Almost everything in Birmingham was segregated. Drinking fountains, schools, bus stations, public parks, churches, drinking fountains, waiting rooms, nightclubs, even bathrooms were segregated in Birmingham. In addition, there was also racial injustice in the city. Blacks worked in the most menial and low-paying jobs. They were the last hired and the first fired. The court system provided little or no fair play for blacks in this city. And it's not surprising that Birmingham was often referred to as the uh, 
Johannesburg of the United States. In the black community of Birmingham, the most active organization promoting rights for blacks was the NAACP. It had championed school integration, justice in the courts, equal pay for black teachers, and many other civil rights uh, causes. And the idea prevailed, the idea prevailed in political circles among those that had the real political power in the state and in the city of Alabama. The idea prevailed that to get rid of the NAACP would thwart uh, black activism and would destroy uh, the ability of blacks uh, to champion the causes of civil rights. And so in 1956, the NAACP was outlawed in the state of Alabama. And it's interesting how they did this. It's interesting how they uh, were able to accomplish this. They learned from Louisiana uh, because Louisiana had outlawed the NAACP. And so Alabama, learning from Louisiana, put forth the same strategy. And this was the way they did it in Alabama. The uh, Alabama legislature passed a law. And that law said that any organization operating in Alabama, but that was headquartered outside the state, would have to show its incorporation papers and its membership role. Well, you can imagine what would have happened if the membership role of the NAACP had been made available to certain groups. There would certainly have been retaliation uh, against those persons who were members of the NAACP. They may have been threatened, their homes may have been bombed, their mortgage payment would have become due in full uh, you can just imagine the kind of reprisals that would have brought uh, to black citizens who were members of the NACP. And so the NACP refused uh, to show its membership role. And it was thereby outlawed, declared illegal, and prohibited from operating in the state of Alabama. Uh, this was, this outlawing of the NAACP was the beginning of the civil rights movement in this city. Uh, disturbed, disturbed by this, disturbed by this, by the outlawing of the NAACP, the Reverend Fred Shellsworth, a new pastor in town, pastor of the Bethel Baptist Church in North Birmingham, felt that it was necessary uh, to start another organization to take the place of the NAACP. He called together a group of pastors and community leaders and they decided to have a mass meeting to form a civil rights organization. The meeting took place at the Sardis Baptist Church on June 4, 1956. And the organization that was formed was the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights with Fred Shellsworth as president. This was the beginning, 
the outlawing of the NAACP and the, and the organization of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. This was the beginning of the mass-based civil rights movement in Birmingham, as I've already said. The charter of the organization stated uh, as its goal the elimination of every vestige of second-class citizenship that existed in the city. And really segregation, really segregation, uh, which had developed in the American South in the last uh, years of the 19th century, segregation became the real target of this new organization. The strategy uh, was a combination of direct action, a, a combination of uh, direct action and legal challenge. Fred Shellsworth and other members of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights would break segregation laws and then would challenge those laws in the courts. A most important feature of the Birmingham movement was the central and all-encompassing role of Fred Shellsworth. The key to Fred Shellsworth was stubborn will. If you knew him personally, as I did, you would know that uh, Fred Shellsworth had stubborn will. <laughs> or stubborn will. Indomitable faith. And a sense of divine uh, compulsion and destiny. He was convinced that God had uh, given him the task to destroy legal segregation in Birmingham and would be with him. Surrounding Shellsworth were a group of about 20 other pastors who were devoted to his leadership. And like uh, Fred Shellsworth, like Fred Shellsworth, uh, they had become disgusted uh, by the continuing racism in the city and were dedicated to destroying it. I, I don't have uh, time in this presentation to name some of those other pastors, uh, and this is not a cheap advertisement. I'm not using Vulcan to uh, advertise my book, but if you want to know some of those other pastors, <laughs> <laughs> you can pick up a copy of, uh, of uh, A Shelter in the Storm, the African-American church in Birmingham from 1815 to 1963. Uh, these, these pastors, about 20 of them, uh, and it's interesting, uh, uh, they, 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 they had just, uh, they were not the pastors of the large churches. They were the pastors of the small churches. Uh, but to hear their stories is, is very revealing. Uh, that they had really just become disgusted. Uh, 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 Ed Gardner, who was the second in command to Fred Shellsworth in that organization, and when I interviewed him, he said one of the things that really disgusted him was he was working at VA hospital and there was a black elevator and a white elevator. And he said that just gnawed on him. He got where he couldn't hardly sleep and that kind of thing. But, but these men had become disgusted by the continuing racism in the city. They drew strength from Shellsworth's militancy and were convinced that he was God's agent for the destruction of Jim Crow in Birmingham. 
the religious fervor of the African American church with its emphasis on liberation theology. And, and is everybody with me? Yeah, with its emphasis on liberation theology. Uh, with this emphasis on the fact that God was a God of deliverance and that the main ideas in the Old Testament and New Testament uh, were the ideas of a God who delivered the oppressed, who was a friend of the outcast. Uh, well, this emphasis, this emphasis, this emphasis was at the heart and soul of the movement. And, and what I'm suggesting unashamedly, and, 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 uh, uh, and to understand what happened in Birmingham, what culminated in 1963, uh, it is important to understand that this was not a secular movement. This was a religious movement. And, and many people, uh, uh, some of my colleagues, don't, don't see that too well. I don't see why they can't see it. But this was, this was a movement of the church, the, the African-American church, uh, with its emphasis on God as a, a liberator, and a person who was concerned about the poor and oppressed. And I don't mean to spend too much time on this because my time is moving, but I think you must understand that. Uh, if you're going to understand, and, and, and 1963 is just a continuation of that. 1963, it culminates. And, and I'll say more about, more about, more about, uh, more about that. Uh, in fact, in every way, in almost every way, uh, the movement, uh, the Alabama Christian movement, uh, mirrored uh, 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 an African-American church. Uh, that organization was, a, was a, a church organization doing political and civil rights work. Uh, well, let me just give you a few, a few things to, to prove that. Well, you know, uh, uh, its uh, president, its leader was a charismatic figure in a pastoral mold who was convinced that he was called by God. <coughs> and that's Fred Shellsworth. Uh, those 20 pastors who were on the board of directors uh, and you did have some labor involved as well, but, but primarily pastors, they resemble a board of deacons in a traditional African-American church. That is, they met when the leader called them to meet, and uh, they sanctioned what he had to say. Uh, fundraising resembled that of an African-American church. Because the fundraising uh, pretty much came from dues and from offerings at mass meetings. And uh, 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 also there were teas and banquets and candy and bake sales. Uh, this political movement, look at this, this political movement had its own ushers. And in addition to having its own ushers, it had its own choir. Now you tell me that's not a church. <laughs> so, 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 in every way it resembled, in every way it resembled, it resembled an African American church. And this clinches it, this clinches it. Like in the African American churches, women made up the majority of the membership of the 600 members of the Alabama Christian movement, which was this, the, the civil rights thrust of this whole movement. 
of the 600 members, 65% were women. And I just wrote an article recently, I forget the name of the publication, uh, talking about the uh, fact that uh, uh, women were indispensable. They were indispensable to the movement, but they were, they were convinced like Shellsworth. They were convinced like Shellsworth that, uh, that, that God wanted segregation destroyed and that he would be with them. And uh, Lucinda Roby, who taught in the school system, and you know, teachers weren't supposed to engage in anything that was political, but Lucinda Roby participated in the movement and she was quite feisty. Uh, she's about the only person who would challenge Shellsworth. Uh, and I could name so many others that were that were so indispensable to this movement. Well, from 1956 to 1963, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights attacked all forms of segregation in the city of Birmingham. Uh, and let me just name a few. The hiring of African-American policemen was one of the initial thrusts of this organization. Segregation in bus and train terminals came to the attention of the group when an African-American couple was attacked in a white-only waiting room in 1957. Also in 1957, the Little Rock School integration episode inspired Shellsworth and the Birmingham Civil Rights Movement through the Alabama Christian Movement to challenge segregation in the public schools. And I think one of the most uh, graphic moments in the Birmingham Civil Rights Movement was when Shellsworth and his wife uh, went to Phillips High School and they were attacked. Uh, his wife was uh, uh, was cut with a knife in her leg, and Fred Shellsworth was attacked with men who had chains. <coughs> and I heard him say, I heard him say many times, several times, I heard Fred say several times that if he had been hit one more time, he does not know whether or not he would have survived that attack. I, I think it's clear that of all the civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Fred Shellsworth, you name them, uh, uh, Martin Luther King, Ralph Abernathy, you name them, Wyatt Walker, of all of the civil rights leaders, no leader showed more courage and more activism than, than Fred Shellsworth. The Birmingham movement also attacked segregation in public parks. And in 1962, it attempted to integrate eating facilities uh, in department stores in Birmingham. Uh, but despite, despite its strong leadership, and dedicated fellowship. The Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights was limited in its success. The movement has succeeded in integrating the buses and also the train and terminal stations. Uh, but despite numerous jailings and other attacks, schools remained segregated. There were not, no black policemen had been hired. Public accommodations were segregated. And there had been no elevation of black employment in the city. 
the city government led by Public Safety Commissioner Eugene Bull Connor had simply refused to make concessions uh, and, 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 and to show you the, 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 the entrenchment of, of, of segregation in the city of Birmingham and, and, and how Birmingham would not meet these civil rights leaders halfway is to look at what happened with the city parks in Birmingham. Uh, one of the federal judges ruled that uh, the parks in Birmingham had to integrate. Well, Eugene Bull Connor did this. Instead of integrating the parks, he closed all the parks. <laughs> and so blacks and whites were denied of access to any of the parks. That just shows you how entrenched, how, how entrenched uh, racism was in the city of Birmingham. Well, realizing that he needed help, realizing that he needed help, Shellsworth invited Martin Luther King and SCLC to come to Birmingham and assist the movement. The only way, he said to Dr. King, the only way this city is ever going to change is for our two organizations to join forces and do battle with sin and darkness here in Birmingham. Uh, after the Montgomery bus boycott, uh, Martin Luther King had started the organization SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and Shellsworth was an officer in that organization. And so he knew that that organization and, and, and King himself uh, could bring added clout to the movement. And so as you can see here, he invited uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to come to Birmingham in 1963. Uh, King uh, had, uh, had a campaign in Albany, Georgia a few months earlier, and really he had failed in Albany, Georgia. Uh, he had not reached his goals, and, and his reputation was somewhat at a low ebb because there were always opponents of nonviolence and this kind of thing. So in many ways, Dr. King was at a low ebb in terms of his movement, having, having just left Albany, having just left Albany. And there's much more I could say about that. He, and, and, and he said many times, he, he said many times, he said to a group of us that he never, never planned to make the same mistake in other places that he made in Albany. He just went into Albany to make a speech and boom, the movement began with no planning or anything. He said that's the reason he failed in Albany. And so he was somewhat at a low ebb in terms of his career and in terms of uh, his movement. King though, looking at Birmingham, looking at Shellsworth and knowing many of the pastors in the city and knowing that there was a strong movement made the decision to come to Birmingham. And he called a meeting of his staff at Dorchester, Georgia to plan the Birmingham campaign. He planned it. He planned the movement. Uh, uh, leaving most of the 
file preparations to Y.T. Walker, who was the executive secretary of the movement. And Walker had come to the city. He had looked at where the chain, where the stores were and, and, and how you could quickly get to downtown. So that was detailed planning, detailed planning uh, for the Birmingham movement. King hesitated, though. He had made plans to come. He hesitated because what was also going on in Birmingham was an election to change the city of government and also an election between Eugene Bull Connor and Albert Boutwell. And, uh, and, and Birmingham really ended up with two governments one led by Connor and one led by Boutwell. So it was a very interesting time in Birmingham. One, one, one person would come in and have his meeting, plan the city business, and then when that was over, the other group would come in. So King hesitated to come. He hesitated to come. But he finally made the decision uh, that the time was right to come into Birmingham. King made three giant contributions to the civil rights movement in Birmingham. When we look at 1963, uh, uh, the year that he came, he, he made three giant contributions to the movement in Birmingham. Number one, he brought with him the national media. Martin Luther King, an international figure, and everywhere he went, the three networks came. There weren't but three then. Now, now there may be a hundred, I don't know. <laughs> no, not that many, but uh, it seems that way sometimes. Uh, but then you had what? NBC, ABC, and CBS. That's all you had. I wonder how we made it. Uh, <laughs> And then, what, what was it, 15 minutes national news and 15 minutes local news uh, 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 during that time. And there's no question that television really helped this civil rights movement. That's, that's another factor. That's another factor in the whole, in the whole business, in the whole business. But, but King, being an international figure, 1963, coming to Birmingham, and what did that do for Birmingham? The national spotlight was focused then on Birmingham. Secondly, uh, Martin Luther King broadened uh, the movement. Uh, some segments of the Birmingham African American community had not responded to Shellsworth leadership. Uh, among those were a significant number of pastors, especially those with the larger and more prestigious churches. Uh, and several professional blacks. Uh, but when King came in, when King came in, many of those persons uh, joined the movement because of who Martin Luther King was and, and what he represented. Uh, for example, uh, the pastor of the church that would become the headquarter church for most of the movement, John Cross, had not joined the movement. But when Martin Luther King made a plea at the Birmingham Baptist Ministers Conference that was meeting at the Bible College. Cross was convicted until the pastor of 16th Street Church came into the movement. The pastor of the largest church in the city of Birmingham had not come into the movement. Uh, John Porter, John Porter and Shellsworth had had a run-in 
Uh, now maybe I shouldn't tell you all the inside <laughs> stuff, but uh, maybe that's what we're going to ask to speak. Uh, Shellsworth was, was highly opinionated. And uh, this, I'm not trying to diminish his, Im his, his image or uh, anything like that, but uh, John Porter, uh, and if you know John Porter, I knew John Porter, he's such a mild-mannered person, but he had in a speech made some suggestions uh, of some changes needed in the movement. And after the speech, Fred Shellsworth let him know that this was not John Porter's movement, but it was his movement. <laughs> and so the pastor of the largest church. But look at this, look at this. When John Porter was a student at Alabama State University, he was Martin Luther King's student assistant at Dexter Avenue Church. And so when Martin Luther King came to Birmingham, there's no way that John Porter would not participate. Uh, so, so King, King uh, brought, brought new people in, new people in to the movement. Uh, a strong black businessman, uh, Alexander, I don't recall his first name now, but he had not participated in the movement, but he was a strong insurance agent in Birmingham. He had been a student, though, with Martin Luther King at Morehouse College. And so he joined the movement. So uh, 1963, Martin Luther King comes. The movement is suddenly thrust into the national limelight. And King greatly strengthens the movement uh, by broadening it and bringing in people who would be a great asset. But that was a third thing. That was a third thing that King did in 1963, a third contribution he made in 1963. And that is he enhanced the religious dimension of the movement. As I've said to you, to understand this movement, you have to understand it as a religious movement. Uh, and remember, Martin Luther King was a Baptist preacher. Uh, his uh, father, uh, called Daddy King, was pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. And then his grandfather, Martin Luther King's grandfather on his mother's side had also been a preacher and was pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church. So Martin Luther King was a Baptist preacher whose vision of religion and, and vision of what the church ought to be doing uh, uh, that had been shaped by the African-American church. And so uh, his coming, his coming number three, in no way, in no way diminished the religious aspect of the movement but it heightened it. Meetings had to be held in the larger churches. King Abernathy and Shellsworth took center stage. It was at these meetings that persons who were willing to go to jail came down front after the appeal had been made. And this was reminiscent of the way people joined African American churches. They joined those churches after the preacher got through preaching and made their appeals. In addition, in addition, uh, King's time in Birmingham took on strong religious symbolism. He was arrested on Good Friday. And while in jail in Birmingham, he wrote a letter <coughs> 
to a group of white clergymen uh, who had uh, criticized him for coming to Birmingham. This, of course, being reminiscent of the prison letters of the Apostle Paul. Well, the climax of the movement in Birmingham in 1963 began with King's decision to intensify the demonstrations using children. And in many ways, this is what saved the movement in Birmingham. Uh, people had been going to jail. But as I heard one of the civil rights leaders say, uh, adults have to pay bills. So they can't spend all that time in leisure in a Birmingham jail. Uh, but uh, they were running out of demonstrators. They were running out of demonstrators. That was a kind of a crisis, crisis. And in the meantime, James Bevel, one of King's assistants, had been working among the young people have been working among the high school students, uh, teaching them black history and black activism and, and these kinds of things. And Bevel said to Dr. King, uh, the children of the young people are ready to march. And Dr. King had a major decision to make, whether or not to release those young people to march. And he decided in the affirmative. He said that what we're doing, we're doing it for them as well as for others. That was one of the basics, bases of his decision. And so he released. And as you can understand, Hundreds of young people began to march into Birmingham, march uh, against segregation in the stores and other things in Birmingham. Uh, and there are photos, many photos of young people streaming out of the 16th Street Baptist Church, going to Kelly Ingram Park and then downtown. Well, Eugene Bull Connor, police commissioner, panicked. And, 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 and he's an interesting character. He's an interesting character. I, I don't have but about five minutes. I can't tell the story I want to tell on Eugene. Well, it's so juicy. I made that better. <laughs> it's all right, Bill, about you. You know Eugene Bull Connor, don't you? He, he had been public safety director. Oh, that's so much here, so much here. And uh, he, had, he, had, he had been a politician earlier. He got the name Bull because he was an announcer for the Birmingham Barons. And became a little popular and he was elected a politician. I think public safety director. But Birmingham has always been a place of politics, white and black. And so they decided to set him up. <coughs> I think everybody here is an adult. You all can stand this here. And uh, 12 o'clock midnight, Bull Connor and his secretary were in a room in the Tutwiler <laughs> Hotel. <laughs> and uh, the police just happened to raid the hotel. <laughs> And they caught him with his secretary. She had on a negligee. <laughs> and he claimed he was just doing some late work. Uh, <laughs> and I say to my students, you know, and, 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 and there's some juicy things in history. There's some juicy things as you go through history. 
Well, Bull Connor uh, being challenged, uh, but panicked, and he let loose dogs and hoses. And, and guess what happened? ABC, NBC, CBS picked that up, and the whole world. Now, this is, this is the climax of 1963. The whole world saw such oppression. And there was a tremendous reaction against it. John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, sent in Burke Marshall, sent in Burke Marshall, sent in Burke Marshall as his negotiator. And Burke Marshall negotiated a settlement in which there would be, uh, eventually, the signs would come down, the segregated signs would come down in time. Uh, there would be black salespersons in the stores. And blacks interpreted this as a great victory uh, for the civil rights movement and of ending uh, many vestiges of segregation in the city. One of the things Birmingham did, it led to the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and that is important. That is important. Uh, this act, if you, as you may recall, was called for by President John Kennedy in his civil rights speech of June 11, 1963. John Kennedy made one of the most powerful speeches for racial justice that night, June 11, 1963. And he said that night that he was calling on Congress, calling on Congress to pass a Civil Rights Act. And this act was introduced in the House of Representatives, introduced in the House of Representatives on June 20th, 1963. And on July 2nd, 1964, it was signed into law by President John, by President Lyndon Johnson Introduced by Kennedy, but what happened to Kennedy? When was it? October, November? He was what? Assassinated. And Johnson said to the nation, let us pass this act. This is the greatest memorial that we could ever give, or the greatest tribute we could ever give to John F. Kennedy. And so Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, probably the greatest civil rights president. And isn't it interesting how things work? Uh, and I'm not in Oak Grove Church, but I was in, if I were in Oak Grove Church, Philip, I would say it's interesting how God works. Because when you look at the civil rights movement, a lot of people that weren't supposed to help it, helped it. And Lyndon Johnson from Southwest Texas rose to great power, a southerner, but rose to great heights. Of course, he lost the, he politically lost the South, and the Democrats haven't recovered yet. Uh, well, I, let me leave that alone. It's, good, it's, it, it's a good thing it's time for me to close down. Here. It's a good thing. It's time for me to close down, and I'm getting into uh, some areas. But he lost, he lost the South. Uh, but one of the, but the greatest civil rights leader, he pioneered through Congress the 1964 Civil Rights Act. This act has 11 titles to it, but it was the strongest civil rights act ever passed by Congress, uh, and uh, many things, many things, but one of the things that 
I remember most about this act was that it destroyed legal segregation in public accommodations. And it said this, if you open a business to the public, you got to serve everybody equally and give everybody equal access. And that was not all to it, but that was a powerful act. Uh, but it, it, it fostered voting rights. It fostered uh, women rights. It uh, broadened the Civil Rights Commission. Uh, so Birmingham, because of Birmingham, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And finally, let me, let me say this. Not only did Birmingham cause the passage of that act, uh, but it also rehabilitated uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And I've already said that Albany had somewhat uh, dulled his importance in the movement, and people were saying, we told you nonviolence will not do it. But because of Birmingham, uh, King's reputation uh, would be revived. And he would go from Birmingham to give that great speech, March on Washington. He'd go from Birmingham to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. He would go from Birmingham to uh, lead the Selma demonstration that gave the second great peak, provided the second great peak, which had revolutionized politics in the South and in the United States, and that was the 1965 Voting Rights Act. All of this was made possible because of the civil rights movement in Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.